Hi, it's Susan from World Peaceful, and I'm going to read an interview between George Negus, who is an Australian journalist who's very famous here in Australia, and Jan Janice Karpinski, the former Abu Ghraib commander. It's essential understanding so that people can get a much clearer definition between what is legitimate and what is not legitimate in warfare. In my previous videos, I've been talking about the targeting of civilians. It's like we've moved from what was once just war, which in my view as a peacemaker, I just have to sit with just war because obviously I'm not pro-violence, <laughs> but violence happens. And if we're really, really honest, all of us have had negative thoughts and, of course, all violence comes from negativity. So it's not a hard and fast us and them. We all have the capacity for violence. We all have the capacity for groupthink. We all have the capacity to attack the vulnerable. We all have the capacity to obey orders because we believe we have no power. So I think there's a universal in serving those who are clearly engaging in activities that are harming others. And really they can only do this when everybody is complicit or compliant, believing that they have no choice. And in the military you tend to find an amplification of this because the very culture is about obedience. And that obedience is um, a story that feeds into if you aren't obedient, it can risk us as a group, as a collective. We have to be one fighting machine. Now, I'm not necessarily saying in respect of military strategy that that's not a truism for military strategy. I'm sure it would be. But it can become deeply ingrained within people that you cannot question authority. You just have to blindly follow. So there is a difference between acting as one unified force and blindly following because you're powerless. So what do they say? Bad things only happen when good people do nothing. And I think that's a really important message for our world where people say, oh, I can't do anything. You know, I don't believe in any of that. Of course you can do something. Everybody can. You can even speak. You can use your mouth. <laughs> speak, do what I'm doing. <laughs> do videos. But do it in a way that is for the highest good of everybody, not just a venting. Because <laughs> you may not get, well, I don't get a lot of hits myself, but I'm just thinking you may not get a lot of hits. <laughs> I'm still unknown, but that's okay. I actually don't mind. So I'll read this out and you can contemplate the ethics in all of this. And this new theatre of war, which is, I just get the words, the gloves are off, like they don't care. <laughs> when I laugh, don't get me wrong, I, I, I come from a humorous disposition, <laughs> so I see humour in a lot of things. And I, there's almost a disbelief in some of the things that I've been reading. It's like, God, they're so different from me. I won't even step on an ant. That's about as, as, yeah, as violent as I get. It'd be accidental and I probably wouldn't feel good about it. <laughs> so anyway, let's go to George Negus. He's an investigative reporter. He used to be on Foreign Correspondent here in Australia and was a very well-respected journalist. So he starts the interview with, the world was actually quite outraged by what happened at Abu Ghraib and now are wanting to know how in heaven that could possibly do. You are claiming that you are a scapegoat in all of this and that the whole thing went right to the top. Who do you think is ultimately responsible? Janice Kapinski says, well, I think if you're looking to find the start, you have to go back to the memorandum that was authored by our now Attorney General, Alberto Gonzalez, and John Yu from out in California, who was with the current administration at the time, 
and they did a memorandum authorising departures from the Geneva Conventions. That's what I mean by the gloves are off. There is no rules. There's no reference to the Geneva Conventions of applying decency in warfare. And so it's, it's definitely moved into a completely different realm. So George Negus says, so what you're saying is that people like yourself as the commander of the prison at the time had no idea that the American government was taking no notice whatsoever of any Geneva Convention and therefore, if you like, <laughs> the gloves were off and anything was okay so far as torture and interrogation was concerned. I laughed there because I didn't reread this. I just pulled it out of my papers and I got the feeling to read it. <laughs> so when I saw the gloves are off, I'm tuning in, it's good. But getting beyond that, I just want to sit with it for a minute. So no holes barred. There is no rules in this, which is really, really a stark difference if you look at the civil society and we have laws, stalking or harassment or bullying, violent attacks are met with a response which is enshrined in laws that say this is not a reflection of who we are as a civilization. We do not murder each other. We do not harass each other. We have to have rules around that in order to ensure social order and to protect the vulnerable in our society. So we're looking at two worlds here. Janice Kapinski says, absolutely, in respect of the gloves are off. And remember that military police detention operations are separate and apart from military interrogations. And they always have been. There are regulations that govern the conduct of soldiers in each of the special specialities. There had never been any discussion of military police personnel working for interrogators or with interrogators or setting the conditions as was happening down in Guantanamo Bay. None of those discussions were held with me or anybody else in the 800th Military Police Brigade. So she's a commander of Abu Ghraib. No conversations with her in respect of these military police working for interrogators. George Negus says, are you saying, and to have said this goes right to the top, you have mentioned Attorney General Gonzalez, Attorney General Gonzalez, but are you saying that the American government at the highest level sanctioned, condoned, if indeed encouraged, what we know to be the abuse of detainees? Janice says, the memorandum, which was certainly discussed at length with the Secretary of Defence and the Vice President, according to sworn statements by people who were there when those conversations took place, that authorised the initial departure. And yes, there was a memorandum that was posted at Abu Ghraib prison that I only became aware of after I heard of this ongoing investigation out at Abu Ghraib and it was signed by the Secretary of Defence. George says, and it, has, and it had a note in the margins that said, in quotes, this must happen. Well, there's your intent. Janice says, yes, make sure this happens. George says, and you attribute that to Donald Rumsfeld. Janice says, well, the signature on the memorandum was over the signature block of the Secretary of Defence, Donald Rumsfeld, and the ink that was used to sign appeared to be the same ink used for this handwritten note in the margin. Make sure this happens. And it was a list of interrogation techniques that were approved. So he obviously had knowledge of those interrogation techniques I just want to add in here in respect of signatures on official documents. Now, I don't know, I assume it's similar in the United States, but certainly here in Australia, I've noticed 
departments use different signatures. So they have the role of the person, but someone else countersigns it or they get someone else to write it. And what it, it suggests to me is a lack of accountability. Now, I don't know if the signature in respect of this memorandum was Donald Rumsfeld. It, they're not saying that, but they're saying, she's saying that the ink that was used to sign was the same as that in the, in the handwritten note. But did he sign Donald Rumsfeld? See, that's, and then you, it's very difficult for people to prove, is this the person? But clearly it's authorised. So you could certainly say he is authorising this, even if someone's countersigned it. But it might have a legal implication if it's not his signature. People have to become very mindful of this. We want transparency and honesty. As was stated in um, David um, McNichol in respect of his his work that he's done. Just having a quick look in my files here. McBride is his name. I knew I had his name wrong. McBride. He's the one that the Australian Federal Police um, were seeking files on at the ABC here in Australia. So he's a, a military lawyer in Australia. This is a separate story, but nonetheless, he is talking about criminality in warfare. So he's looking into human rights, well, specifically international humanitarian law. So that sort of is a little bit of an aside because of these interrogation techniques which are to brutalise and abuse people in a civil society that would be a criminal offence. In a military forum, it doesn't appear to be. So when we've got military lawyers, you know, attempting to criminalise violence in war, that's moving out because the Geneva Conventions aren't being applied here. So how do you protect innocent people is a, is a key question. It's also the use of violence for the sake of it is another important clue in this. George goes on to say, Janice, you have been attributed with the comment that Donald Rumsfeld ordered the torture that occurred at Abu Ghraib. That is a gigantic call. Are you prepared to stick by that, that it went that high? Jenna says, absolutely. When the Secretary of Defence, when General Miller, when General Sanchez, when General Taguba, when they testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee, they were very careful to say no response to a question about the photographs that they knew nothing about the photographs. And of course, people might remember from the television many years ago, there were all those really powerful photos of people with bags on their heads at Abu Ghraib, dogs being set on them. You know, a lot of cruel um, behavior directed by those military personnel towards these detainees. And it shocked Americans because this is not who they are. Goes on to say, however, this is Janice, however, nobody on the Senate Armed Services Committee asked them, did you know anything about the actions depicted in those photographs? Because they would have, have had to have given a truthful answer and the answer would have been yes. In fact, they authorised the actions depicted in those photos. The Secretary of Defence authorised it in conversations with General Miller, his Under Secretary for Intelligence, not only authorised those actions, but was staying on top of the progress of those actions and those activities. George then says, when you found out what had been going on in that block, the abuse that was occurring, we now know from the pictures that we and other networks have shown what was your reaction. What did you try and do about it? And Janice says, well, I'm shocked. I'm, I was absolutely shocked. And when I saw the photographs, I'd heard about 
the investigation actually 11 days before I saw the photographs. Finally, as soon as I heard there was an ongoing investigation at Abu Ghraib, although the prison at Abu Ghraib itself was no longer under my control, we left the location where we were, very close to the Iranian border, and drove into Baghdad and immediately went out to Abu Ghraib to see what, what had happened. What, what was this ongoing investigation? What with the allegations and, of course, all of the people, including the soldiers shown in the photographs, they had already been removed from their positions at Abu Ghraib. And shortly after that, when I tried to get access to those soldiers to ask them what in the world was going on, I was told that they did not work for me and I had no right to have access to any one of them. So she was isolated. That's another form of bullying. It's always a warning sign. Although military could say, on the other hand, no, it's military protocol. She's no longer the commander. They don't have to speak to her. But it suggests, the way she's put this, it's suggesting that they've been told not to. And that in itself is suspicious. George then says, in November 2003, there was a riot and we have spoken to two of the guards, two of the people under your command originally, who talked about that riot where unarmed Iraqis were killed using firstly non-lethal ammunition, plastic bullets, and then live am ammunition. Who ordered this? Janice says, the battalion commander who was on site at Abu Ghraib ordered the soldiers to go to lethal ammunition. It is actually standard operating procedure. Now, when you have, have several thousand prisoners in confinement, just take that in, several thousand prisoners in confinement and it gets out of control and it did very quickly they tried to bring it under control with non-lethal rubber bullets usually and because it was a winter month i believe it occurred in october november time frame and it was cold so the prisoners had jackets or sweaters on over their clothing the rubber bullets were not being very effective well, the big question there is why were they um, out of control? We'll find out. George then says, the men we have spoken to under your command said it was like a turnkey shoot, a turkey shoot, that unarmed Iraqis were gunned down. So harking back to my previous videos on targeted killings, how does this fit into all of that? These people are in a jail. These are Iraqi, likely to be mostly civilians. And when they refer to it getting out of control in the prison, because there's thousands there that have been detained, they're describing it as a turkey shoot. I mean, where's the humanity in that? I mean, do we do this in jails when they get out of control? Do people just open fire? No, they don't. So there's a difference in the way that people are seen because they're considered an enemy of the state. And what I'm learning in respect of vulnerable people is the way that they're seen. If there's no compassion around that, you can go eat cake. They don't, they don't care at all. So the psychopath looks upon that vulnerable other with no feeling at all. So I'll continue on. George says, the men we have spoken to under your command say it was a turkey shoot, okay, that unarmed Iraqis were gunned down. Janice then says, I have to tell you and I have to emphasise this. When you have far too few military police personnel to guard far too many prisoners and they get out of control and it is on the verge of them being able to break through the compounds a battalion commander is authorized to take the action necessary to bring that situation under control do you hear the language in it to bring it under control not we, we can kill someone in order to stop them escaping because that's what they would be doing those prisoners would be wanting to get the hell out of there 
So when they, even when they're making dis, uh, sort of narratives around out of control, they're not necessarily saying anything in respect of them being attacked by these people. One can only assume that the people want to get out. George then says, Janice, the irony is that now you're facing a lawsuit with Donald Rumsfeld, with Sanchez, with Pappas, as being guilty of legal responsibility for the torture and abuse of detainees in Abu Ghraib. Now, if you're an innocent party in all of this, somebody who has been a scapegoat for these other people, why are you being charged with this that same crime? She says, well, because they're trying to make it appear the organisation that filed the lawsuit is the Civil Liberties Union. I believe that human rights is involved in a lawsuit as well. And they included me because the soldiers were assigned to a company, assigned to one of my subordinate battalions. But the truth will come out during the, that testimony and it does not make any difference what side I represent. I intend to tell the truth. And the truth, the truth is they kept the information from me. We did not discover until long after the photographs were released that these actions were endorsed at the highest levels of our government and were taking place at Guantanamo Bay and in Bagram Air Force Base in Afghanistan long before Abu Ghraib was in anybody's discussion. George Negus says, in all reality, though, if you say you claim you are totally innocent of these sorts of charges, do you really expect that Donald Rumsfeld will be found guilty of those allegations, those charges? Janice says no. And it is my understanding that even as recently as yesterday, the attorneys went to court and asked for the case to be dismissed because the Secretary of Defence apparently has some protections in his position. <clears throat> now, that's a critical statement. And this is why bad things happen, because people are being protected at the highest levels. This is very problematic. I will post that statement about when good people do nothing, bad things happen. It's absolutely critical with this type of thing because it's the silence of the many that enables this to happen. It's also these protections that come around those in these highest positions, people are looking after each other. So what can happen is if there are groups of people who are psychopathic, and I, I say this as a mental health problem because that's how I see it. So even the statement of, you know, when good people do nothing, bad things happen, there is a truism to that, but by implication, a person who is a psychopath, for example, they are what they are. And in many respects, they feel what they feel or they don't feel what they don't feel. The latter, of course, would be the case. So how can we punish someone who can't feel? The question is how do those types of people who have that mental health issue get into the highest positions? There should be screening in powerful positions that people do not have. I mean, they could fake their way through an, a social emotional intelligence test. They could mimic reactions of care and concern when they see violent images, for example, if you were trying to test for that. But you'd have to look into their background. What actually have they done over their lives? Has there been any demonstration that they have actually shown concern for humanity? or service to humanity, because these roles in, re in reality at the very top are supposed to be in service to the people. But quite often what we see is it's all about power and influence, it's about who you know, there's agendas going on which are about power and control, not service. So we've got very different dynamics being the criteria or the forward motion that brings these individuals into power. So he was protected, it appears. George then says, the Taguba report, that's T-A-G-U-B-A, actually said that you showed lack of leadership in all of this and therefore you are partly responsible for what happened. 
So it is certainly not all over yet for you. Jenna says it absolutely is not. But I will tell you this, when they do an investigation with that kind of potential, the rules are very clear. You have to identify an impartial person to do the investigation. And General Taguba did not serve one day in Iraq. He spent his deployment time in the safety of Kuwait. And he was, as it came out afterwards, a good friend of General Sanchez. So if General Sanchez gave the investigating officer specific instructions on what he wanted to see in the conclusions, General Taguba was able and determined to provide and conclude that General Sanchez wanted to see. So give him the conclusions he wants. And he did exactly that. The findings in the report have been largely discredited because he was not an impartial party and because so much more information has come out. Yeah, the importance of a third party investigator, and I'm seeing certainly here, even in, in Australia with regulators, there's no third parties, even though they may claim that they are. I'm not certain about that. Third party investigators are absolutely critical if we want justice to not be seen but actually happen. People have no vested interest in the outcome. People who have no affiliation with those involved. So not unlike a police investigator who's investigating a crime scene, they have to be completely removed and they must be monitored too to make sure that there's no interference with them as they go through the particularly investigations like this one. Because if they are interfered with, and if it's a kangaroo court, as we call it, and it can be called, which is a fake court, this, these are the, the pretense of justice taking place, where there's no jury. And in the military, they can have their military tribunals, but there's no, there's no jury of their peers. So that becomes military law. And that sets itself aside from civil law. Whereas I don't think they should be separate. Particularly now that we're looking at 90% 90, 90 fatalities in war. So going back to this issue, the report that was written, which implicated Janice from what she's saying, was by someone who had absolutely nothing to do with Iraq. He was a friend of General Sanchez, so there was a collegial relationship happening here. He was not neutral. And that should send warning bells of a cover-up, if this is true. And I say that because I can read this, but what I know as a researcher myself and an analyst, until you do extensive checking really into the backgrounds, into the stories of these many things can come to light. The fact that they've got a woman heading up a, detain, a detention centre is concerning as well because they use women to soften the image of the military. I've seen this over and over again in arms traders. I've seen it in defence portfolios, women being positioned. And what's tragic about this is on the one hand they'll call it equal opportunity, but the reality is they're using her femininity to project to the world that this is decent, this is justifiable, and that's how women get used. She may well have been targeted too because she was a woman. Maybe they set her up. We don't know. We don't know, but anything's possible. George then says, you believe that the Taguba inquiry was a foregone conclusion? I set up. <laughs> oh, there we go. See, I haven't read this like in, in about six months. That's funny. Janice goes, absolutely no doubt in my mind because he was not charged with discovering what caused that photo, caused that photograph, the photographs. General Taguba's instructions were to investigate the 800th Military Police Brigade and discover what was wrong with General Karpinski. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> That's a witch hunt scapegoat. Let's find something wrong with her. See, Susan Linderher comes again to mind. 
You know, she was a CIA asset who was whistleblower in respect of 9-11, who was doing her job and and then found herself being persecuted by that ver her very government for doing her job, which was to warn those in authority about these aircraft going into buildings. And then she was detained for a year herself, kangaroo court, you know, where there was the evidence was not allowed to be seen by her attorney. No, no, in, no independent hearing here it was behind closed doors. And again, another female, you know, being persecuted. But it happens to men too, of course. Um, so I'm not really just saying that. But the women may be perceived as more vulnerable because they're females. Because women are really moving into power for the first time, really, in the last 20 years, we're starting to see women moving up in authority but this is a new thing in respect of a patriarchal system that's been going on for a very long time so the men are very practiced in positions of power they have their brotherhoods their groups and they're very much orientated towards power and control whereas the feminine is different we tend to be more relationship oriented we tend to feel for the other party but that's not to say men don't feel they do. Men do. They just manage it differently. There's some very incredibly beautiful males, poets and what have you. So I, I don't want to make it too hard and fast, but there are differences. Let's just leave it in that sort of um, idea. Leave it with that. George then finishes by saying, no doubt we could talk for a lot longer. It's a shame we haven't got more time. But thank you very much for talking to us now. And she thanks him. Well, George should make more time. It's, this is actually in the public interest. <laughs> That's why I'm reading it. So I just want to sit with that for a few moments and then I'll conclude. Yeah, there were a lot of Iraqi civilians rounded up with beards i think oh well in afghanistan there would have been issues with beards because the taliban um, everyone had to have a beard isn't it crazy but that's the way it is because <laughs> i think there was some problems there as well but i'm just going to go to iraq because a lot of these men are getting rounded up and and there's real questions around the intelligence used why were they picked up? Were they just in the wrong place at the wrong time? I mean, we've got a couple of thousand Iraqis. You know, you're in a civil society, you're having a war. Everyone becomes a target because it's not like they're wearing uniforms. They're not. And you've got to understand from the Iraqi perspective, the public, they're being attacked. They see themselves as being attacked. It's terrifying. If people remember those first scenes of the bombing of Baghdad, look like a fireworks display and we can look through our televisions and see objects of things blowing up but imagine the people on the ground under it imagine it was you in fact when new year happened this year i was looking at all the fireworks because i was in a position where i was i was actually elevated and i could actually see right across melbourne I could see all the fireworks and i was contemplating a few things firstly the waste of money and we all said the fire's going <laughs> it's like the mindset that sets all these fireworks off also issues of pollution this i'm just bringing these things in because these were things that i just look at as in sort of incongruent the pollution of them they're very transitory there's a lot of money spent on them a lot of homeless that don't get housed where resources could go that was one aspect the other aspect i was thinking was imagine you were in a war zone and these were missiles and I was watching them all blowing up above the city. And I was just imagining everyone's cheering all at the same time right now. What if they were all screaming at the same time right now? See, in our culture, we don't know this experience. We watch it remotely. We're remote viewers of Syria, remote viewers of Afghanistan, of Iraq, of the Balkans, of Sudan, various other conflicts. We just look for the next news item. It's not a lived experience. And I understand that 
because when I became homeless, that's when it became real for me. And when I talked to people about this subject, they discounted it. There was a lot of prejudice around it because they hadn't experienced it. So I didn't have hard feelings and I don't, but I can see that people will suffer who have been through traumatic experiences and how they might be viewed by others who have not had the experience. But I suspect that that empathy is going to grow as oppression grows in our own society. And when things start to happen that have never happened before, the public will be shocked because that's what, what would have happened in places like Iraq. Iraq was a very sophisticated uh, country. It was a secular nation. It wasn't religious. Saddam Hussein was secular. He had conflicts with the mullahs around the region. So this was a fairly, um, you know, well-to-do second world country. You know, they were using the oil to develop themselves. And I had people tell me who were Iraqi here in Australia that rather than go in and bomb the country, they should have built up the middle class. They said they would have overthrown him anyway. But see, this is what happens. Interference in other countries because there are vested interests, there are oil interests happening here. So this is the commercialization of war. And Abu Ghraib is an outgrowth of the cruelty that has instigated these wars. We're talking about mindsets who care nothing. And it's very hard for the public to understand this. They care nothing. But we like to and we want to believe in the nationalism. We want to believe that there's a good reason for this violence. No, there's never a good reason for the violence. It's a failure. All violence is a failure. It's a weakness, actually. And, of course, those who are in that area will find that an insulting statement because they've always had it built up. So I just say to you, just bear in mind this is just another way of seeing. You believe what you want to believe. I'm a peacemaker, so I'm going to come from this perspective. When you sit with the dying person who's been under a bomb in the rubble of a building and you see their pain and agony in their eyes or their body is broken and they're dying in your arms, it's only at that point do you then make a decision for peace. Out of the Second World War, it was only after 50 million plus were killed. And there was a similar number in the First World War, I might add. This is massive um, war crimes. These are massive atrocities. Crime scenes, I see them as now. When you really sit with it, and it's very hard to get your head around 50 million, it's very hard to get your head around a few hundred. It's hard to get your head around thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of people being murdered. And to find a justifiable reason for that, how is that defending my country? It's not. It's got nothing to do with defence. So it's an attack. But we identify, you see, so strongly because of, of what we've been taught. Rather than going into what is true, what is a decent civilization? What does a decent civilization do? So going back to Abu Ghraib, that's an outcrop of that cruelty that feels nothing for its impact. It's looking with fascination of how those weapons are used, those weapons of mass destruction. They're looking with fascination to see how the torture techniques work because they're practising. These are people who enjoy cruelty. And that's not a narrative that's discussed, but that's what's happening because it's going on and on and on and there's no one, very few coming in and going, you know what, this is not right. This could be my mother. This could be my father, my brother or sister, my family member. These people are largely innocent who are being rounded up into these detention centres. And as Janice has described, this is coming from the top. So it, it really 
it really encourages you to look at the caliber of leadership and are we as civilians going to support this type of leadership that has this mental health issue and it is it definitely is i will always send love to everybody because i actually feel that for everybody there are many who do not know that they do not know and they continue on with behaviours because it's getting silent sanction from others who are fearful of confronting power. And yet when everybody speaks up, when everybody follows what they know in their heart is true, these things will no longer exist on the earth. They'll be gone because there'll be no one supporting them. So that's the message really in the video is let's learn from these experiences. Let's learn from the whistleblowers and let's find solutions on how to turn this around in a way that produces a win-win for everybody ultimately. If we don't, we may not have a world to share. So it's something to give some thought to. I send you love and I send you peace. Thank you.